Good morning, YouTube. Okay, hello everyone. I should probably say good morning. Um, I, as has been said in the introduction, I work as part of the LHC project, which is out at CERN. So the LHC was really made constructed to answer these sorts of questions that I've got on the board behind me. I'm going to just summarise all of these questions in the one that's at the bottom, which is what else is out there. So we know that the equations that we know of don't fully describe the universe. There's some point in energy where they break down. The problem is that we don't really know what that missing piece of the puzzle is. So it's kind of an open question. We don't know exactly what we're looking for, but we know there is something there that we are looking for. So that is really the purpose of CERN, these, to answer these big questions. And so when I first went into particle physics, I had some idea that the field was just overrun with all these eccentric people who kind of sit under trees and have these crazy ideas, and they scribble their ideas down on, on envelopes. And what I've discovered is we don't really do that. We, um, we send emails like everybody else. And uh, we have uh, very long technical meetings. And so you, you see a meeting on the agenda, we have about 30 meetings a day, and you see a meeting which is entitled like microscopic black holes to search for in Atlas. And you go along and, and somebody's there um, saying, oh no, we have to get this data set replicated to tier zero, and someone else is fiddling with the video connection because the Japanese can't connect, and, and all of these sorts of things. And so what I'm really trying to say is the everyday experience of working on these big experiments is really quite far removed from what you might get the impression from in, in the press releases and that's kind of what I'm going to, what I'm going to talk, talk about today. Okay, so I'm going to start with the big science and, and work down. Our universe is made out of an infinite amount of infinitesimally small particles and so we think, think that we can understand more about the universe if we probe into this world of the very small and it's a very bizarre world, the world of the very small. It's, um, it doesn't follow the same rules as ours does at first glance. And it's very hard to get into this world with the very small. So here you see a, a graphical representation from the Science Photo Library of the inside of a proton. Um, it's very difficult to get inside there because these things are bound together very tightly. And so if you really want to get very, very far inside the atom and inside the nucleus, you need a lot of energy. So the machines that we used to, to, to do this have got bigger and bigger and bigger, and bigger. So this is the LHC, and it sits in the shadow of Mont Blanc in Geneva. Um, this is 27 kilometers round, this ring in red, you see. And if you, were, if you were standing by Geneva Airport, we have these proton beams that are going round the ring in opposite directions, and they're going so fast, the protons, that a single proton would pass you 10,000 times per second. So it's almost going at the speed of light, very fast. And what we're interested in is what happens when you, when you collide them together. So we've built this enormous apparatus at the collision point, amongst others. This one's called Atlas, and I think it holds the Guinness Book of World Records for the most complicated machine ever built. <laughs> uh, so it's huge, you see the little guy. Um, it doesn't look like that anymore because that big space is all filled with detector now, but it, it's very big, you get a sense of the scale. And so how, how, did, we, how, did, we make a, how did we make such a complex detector? And the answer really is that we took the task and we divided it into lots of sub-detectors, and each sub-detector was kind of farmed to a different university who had to take the responsibility of doing that bit. So I did my PhD in the UK, and so I was involved in the inner detector, which is the bit that sits right in the middle. It's like the heart of the detector. Um, and I had to work on the, on the cabling of this inner detector. And it's very small, the inner detector. You can fit only about four people inside it. And I actually know that because we used to have to sit inside it when we were working on it. Uh, but there's so many cables that are coming out of this detector, this small heart of a detector that they fill. You have entire corridors that are just filled with cable to get all the electronics readouts somewhere where we can analyze it. And this is us working on these electronics. Uh, they all have to be plugged in by hand 
and we all have to, you know, I spent hours crammed into a cable rack along with my supervisor kind of plugging these things in and everybody was doing this for different parts of the detector. And now it's running, this is what the output looks like. I am intimately familiar with this format because I have to spend a long time looking at it. Um, this is our readout and I work very close to the readout electronics so I, I look at this sort of stuff a lot. This is the most basic thing you could probably imagine just a string of zeros and ones. But inside this huge string, somewhere inside this huge string, so we're, we're, we're triggering, we're, we're running at 40, 40 million collisions per second, 24 hours a day, seven di days a week. And we're a bit like doctors in that many people have phones, I'm one of them, where you have to be the on call for the detector and if there's a problem with the running, you don't want to lose any data, so often you get called in the night, you have to go down and fix something. So there's a lot of these zeros and ones, is what I'm saying. So somewhere in this, there are some fundamental statements about the universe in which we live, somewhere in this stream. And if you want to encapsulate a job as an experimental particle physicist, what it is, is finding that message through all these zeros and ones. And that's, that's kind of what I do, what we all do. So to, to tell you how we start to do this, I'm going to give you a little analogy. If you have a car crash, what you'd usually expect, if you have two cars collide, bits of cars scattered all over the road. Right? So think of that as two protons. What you get afterwards is bit, bits of proton all over the detector. But let's say one time in, say, a million or so, you get something really weird like a bus coming out of collision. Okay? So our buses are like exotic particles like Ws or Zs, and maybe even the completely unknown like Higgs bosons. So we're looking for buses, and I, I kind of like this analogy, so I'm going to press further with it a bit, just to explain to you what my analysis at the moment is. So what the bus does is it doesn't stay being a bus, it turns into two vans, or three cars in a van, almost instantly. But there are some dark matter theories that tell us that maybe the bus, which is produced in Geneva, actually drives to Zurich, and then it decays into two vans. And so that's kind of what my analysis is at the moment, is looking for stuff that travels a little way before it decays. The other thing I work on is, is the trigger. And so what the trigger is, it's a bit, it's a bit of kit, a very big bit of kit, and it's, it's always scanning the detector, looking for buses. And if it sees a bus, it says go, and the whole detector immediately writes all of its data that it's got in its buffers out to an output disk, and then we can look at it and analyze it later. So to analyze it, we need a huge compu computing system. We're only triggering on, I think, about one in 200,000 collisions we write to disk. And I worked that number out at 6 a.m. on the train this morning, so please don't quote me on it or anything, but I think it's about that level. Uh, so last time we had a big experiment working at CERN, we invented the World Wide Web to help us do this kind of complicated analysis. But even that isn't enough. So we're now using, we're the biggest users of this new grid technology, which is distributed computing analysis, and we're heavily relying on that now at CERN, so we can do our analysis and crunch these numbers with these enormous data sets. And so I'm not a grid developer, I don't actually know a huge amount about it, I just know what it is to use it. And so when I'm using it, instead of doing my analysis on a data set which is on my local disk, what I do is I prepare all my analysis, and I kind of package it up in cotton wool, and I send it off, and it goes off to some virtual cyberspace, and then it's kind of doled out in parallel to many different computer centers around the world. They work it out in parallel, then it's all packaged up together, and it's sent back to me as the answer. And so we're, we're all, or the right answer, I hope, but sometimes not. <laughs> it depends. But uh, that, we're, we're all using this now, it turns, this is how the analysis is done from a computing perspective. And so, obviously, you need a lot of people to do this analysis. This is some of the people on Atlas in our, in our building. We share this building, half-half, half belongs to Atlas, half belongs to our rival experiment, which is CMS. The reason why you have two experiments which are very similar, so all these statements I'm saying probably apply to CMS as well, the, the reason you have two is that the chain of analysis is so large and so complex, there are gazillions of places where you could go wrong. And what you really need is two independent verifications of the same result for something as important as a new particle discovery to really say, yes, we've got one. So you have these two experiments, and we don't want to kind of bias each other, so we're not really supposed to talk to each other about work. <laughs> Although, 
We, we would never do such a thing. But uh, we do share a cafeteria, which you can see at the bottom in the middle, in the middle of this building. But other than that, it's, you know, we're split. <laughs> All right. So Atlas is now in really in running mode, and it is churning out plots and, and results very, very quickly, more quickly than I would ever have imagined when we were building it. It's like a, a paper-making machine. And, and this is one of the most recent results of Atlas. So this is the final result. We have 4,000 people, and they make one result. This is the result, and it took 4,000 people to make this plot. And everybody does their, their own little step in the chain, or steps. So what this result says is it's all the new physics search theories we've looked for, and what it also says is we haven't found anything that we're not expecting as of yet. Hopefully that will change. The way that we were able to come up with this result, which really says some rather fundamental things about the universe, is that we took this huge task and we chopped it up almost linearly into many, many small pieces, and we, we combined them at the end to make this plot, which was shown at the conferences. And so, working on Atlas does kind of feel sometimes like you're part of this production line, and people do complain that they feel like part of the production line. This is probably because it's not really the way that doing traditional science is perceived. We've, we've had to move away from traditional incentives, like in science people often really want to be the first person on the author list. And our author list is something like 26 pages long. You can, you know, George Art AAD is the first person, but you know, there's a lot of people who will never be the first person on an Atlas author list. Um, the other thing is that working as part of this production line can sometimes feel rather counterintuitive to to how you're taught as a scientist. You're taught to really verify everything yourself. And, and we have to rely extremely heavily on the person before you and the person after you. You have to trust your collaborators. As a, as a collaboration, this has taken us a long time to get, to get used to, really. I mean, we're, we're not quite there, but I would say in the last two years, we've learned an incredible amount as a collaboration on how to do this collaborative science. And I don't think there's a, many other projects of this scale where people really have to learn to, to do this sort of science. The science has really moved really very far away from this traditional picture of some guy sitting in his lab doing his, his experiments all, all by himself. And I don't think it's just particle physics that is, is moving in this direction. I think there's a lot of, a lot of science, science. Now we have the technology to be able to collaborate with 4,000 people. I mean, if you think, how can you collaborate 4,000 people without email, for example? It would be impossible. Um, and the computing resources and all the new technologies are enabling us to do bigger and bigger science. Um, and so maybe this collaborative science is the, is the science of the future. Thank you. large organizations, uh, see large organizations in our daily work, and we see a lot of finger pointing uh, sometimes. So, and I wonder if there is a production line with 4,000 people that all rely on each other. What happens if something goes wrong? Like if number 2,522 does something wrong? How do you deal with that? It's, it's actually something very interesting, which I've noticed about this collaborative spirit. What I've noticed on Atlas, which you really wouldn't expect, is it's, it's a very big experiment and it's very, very expensive. And you can make some really expensive mistakes. So if you make a mistake and you lose, um, say, one D day of collisions, that is, I, I don't even want to think how expensive that would be. But what you, what you notice is that nobody ever points a finger. I can honestly say, on Atlas, I have never seen a high profile mistake, somebody saying it was this guy that did it. I mean, okay, you need details of what went wrong, but you never see names. And I think that's because everybody understands that it, it really is a collective effort. Um, and it's quite strongly instilled, I would say. Great, and of course, we're also, also wondering, all of us, um, last time you had big amounts of data to organize, somebody invented the web, mm -hmm. sort of like as a little site project. Um, so what are you going to come up with next? What well, is going to come out of that? Well, there is the grid. Um, 
I wouldn't. Uh, I was reading up readings about possible uses for the grid for, say, home users, and I found a quote. It's on Wikipedia, so uh, take that as, as you will. But it says that um, the optical connections which are being developed at CERN, um, the hope is that they will be available to home users, and that would potentially provide a broadband which is 10,000 times faster than the traditional inter internet connection. So I would say probably the grid is going to be the biggest spin-off. But the thing is with this blue sky research is you never know. You, that is the point. You don't know what you're going to find. Maybe, I mean, when J.J. Thompson was looking for the electron, he didn't know what the, what the implications of that would be. He was doing it because he thought it was cool, really. But, I mean, <laughs> if, if we find the Higgs or, or another thing, who knows what it could be used for? Maybe it'll be huge, maybe it won't. We don't know. That's the point. But I think I would buy the, uh, the 10,000 times. Uh, <laughs> but so, so an iTunes movie takes yeah. like uh, one second to download? Or? I don't know. No, it's pretty quick. We have a very fast broadband, but that's not done over the grid. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Thanks for all the